I'm Jason Bradford. I'm Asher Miller. And I'm Rob Dietz. Welcome to Crazy Town, where your favorite ride at the amusement park is the self-driving bumper cars. This is producer Melody Travers. In this season of Crazy Town, Rob, Jason, and Asher are exploring the watershed moments in history that have led humanity into the cascading crises we face in the 21st century. Today's episode is about world's fairs, the diminishing returns of technology, and bizarre notions of progress. The watershed moment took place in 1851. At the time, the estimated carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was 285 parts per million, and the global human population was 1.24 billion. All right, you guys, you ever try to explain to somebody, you know, at a bar or a family uh, family event, how you think about the world and the state of it and our predicament? And it's it's, it's kind of deep. I do it when I want people to clear out. Right. I, <laughs> if I'm at a party or a bar or something, I try to keep it a little lighter yeah, than my worldview. See, I'm an introvert, so I totally pull that Excellent. card out because then, then people clear away. Well, you know, the typical reaction I get, I don't know, I don't know about you, it's like, nah, I don't worry about that much. They'll think of something. Yeah, well, we we did an entire episode on that a couple seasons ago, right? They'll uh, think of yeah. so there was like solar roadways and all this weird technology. Precisely, you're a good you're a good archivist for Crazy Town. <laughs> Gotta be uh, good for something. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna visit this theme again, but in the spirit of this season, we are going to pinpoint the historic moment when this crazy type of thinking got going. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I guess I should be prepared for getting mad because <laughs> this stuff pisses me off like nothing else. Why so? Because it's like it's it's a uh, intellectual laziness. It's capitulation. It's uh, being delusional. Um, I, I could, really thought we could just talk about your anger issues here. And <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about that. Is this an intervention? Yeah. yeah right. Of, right. You're sort of like the uh, new envisioning of the Incredible Hulk. You're always angry. <laughs> Well, right. I mean, it's pretty. This is this way of thinking is pretty ingrained in our culture. And today, we're going to argue that this got going. It got a huge push, at least, from an invention in the year 1851. Hmm. And this invention is ongoing. It's something that still happens today, but in a very diminished cultural importance. We're talking about world's fairs. Mm, oh, yeah. World's fairs. Yeah. Have either, have either of you been to a world's fair? No. No, not once. I've witnessed the aftermath of, of several world's fairs. Uh, well, yes. The, uh, I guess maybe the afterbirth of them. <laughs> if you've been to any major city in North America or Europe, you've probably seen the, 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 the consequences. I, I've climbed the Eiffel Tower. There you go. There you go. Like okay. on the outside, you climbed it. I did, yeah. <laughs> like, I was in a James Bond film. I yeah. thought you were like a King Kong sort of like going Well, you're just outside. talking about me being the Hulk. So I mean, right. it'd be cool if you base jumped it. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so let me introduce you to the this first World's Fair. They're also called you know, expositions, or now they're called World Expos. But anyhow, all the same thing. They're called the Montreal Expos. Yeah, very good, very oh, good. Oh, the baseball team, yeah. Yes. So 1851, this was in London, and it sort of set the standard. Uh, it's It was huge. It, it was a... <clears throat> sprawling complex in Hyde Park, London. This place called the Crystal Palace. I lived across the street from Hyde Park. Oh, really? When I lived in London. Okay. Yeah. Well, wow. you can't see the Crystal Palace anymore. It burned down. But, no. Yeah. <clears throat> but at the it time, doesn't, doesn't seem like you could have seen it then. It's it's a Crystal Palace. You should be looking right through it, right? Well, that was was spectacular. They were using plate glass for the first time in mass. So that was an amazing invention of the of the period, and this thing was gigantic, almost a million square feet. So like a small Amazon warehouse now. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, at the time, a million square feet. Uh, that, it, it's huge. Um, multiple floors, Hell, cast iron framing. It's probably like the size of the mansion that the head of Amazon <laughs> right. lives right. in. It's right. really. Right. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, 
there were about 100,000 objects on display, more than 10 miles you had to walk. There were 15,000 contributors. Wow. This thing went on, this, this, this World's Fair went on for six months. There were millions of people in attendance from 25 different nations. And it's, it's fascinating. It had to be put together very quickly. And this gardener who had been designing glass houses or greenhouses in, in London at the time ended up coming with this proposal that was accepted. And he just produced the biggest, essentially, greenhouse the world had ever seen. And that's where this the exposition was in. And the, the, the drawings that they have of the time are just spectacular. It's just hard to imagine something this size with these these displays from all over the world. So It's uh, too bad that uh, he couldn't have built your greenhouse. Uh, we could have used that, you know, with our <laughs> double duty for for broadcasting this this podcast. Yeah, it gives me an idea what I should do. I should I should sponsor a World Fair on the farm. Here. Right. Right. <laughs> well, okay. So what I'm getting at is this was a huge deal early on in the history of of these of these expos. Millions of people showing up. In fact, the first one in London had about six million. Wait. In in Montreal in 1967, okay, 50 million people showed up, and Canada's population at the time was only 20 million. Yeah, I mean wow. th- that's important. The the like maybe the percentage of population, but I was thinking like how hard was it to get to London? Right back then, you know, it's not like you'd hop on the plane or right. or take the high speed rail or whatever, you know. Yeah, so these were huge draws. Obviously, they were giant, important cultural events. Well, yeah. what I think is the uh, best thing to look at in the in the World's Fair is all the awesome inventions. It's kind of like going into uh, what's the name Q in the James Bond movie <laughs> right, and, right, and right. seeing what what cool <laughs> stuff is on display. So yeah. I mean. You you already mentioned the uh, plate glass. Yeah, plate glass. We we take that for granted nowadays, but that that was a that's a big deal. Obviously, let's talk about two that might be the biggest deals okay. of any inventions ever. Right, okay. If you think about it, one is the telephone. That's right? a big deal. That was that was debuted in Philadelphia in eighteen seventy six. Yeah. Party lines. Graham Bell. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it led to nine seven six numbers. <laughs> yeah. And then electric lights. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I use those every day. Two years later. Yeah. 1878 in Paris. So I did ask us, let's look for some of our favorite things that showed up, uh, made their debut at a World's Fair. And uh, for me in 1878, I also wanted to note that the microphone came on online. And of, of course, that's huge. I mean, look at you, our listeners would not be getting this fabulous content right. if we didn't have these with, with microphones the microphone. in front of our faces. I mean, 1878 might have been like one of the greatest. We'll go through some other yeah. inventions, well, just that one. Yeah, that was uh, in Paris in 1878. That's when they came out with the Statue of Liberty, oh, amazing the phonograph, uh, Braille, mm. uh, you said electric lights, an ice-making machine, and a, a solar concentrator engine. So, wow. Yes. Yeah, that, 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 pretty big uh, stuff. That engine, the solar concentrator, that was the gold medal winner, and it was fascinating because the inventor was looking ahead to when coal reserves and oil reserves would deplete he wanted, to, ha- he wanted to have he wanted to have he's just a, a little ahead of his time he was a little ahead of time so people were like eh whatever yeah, fuck that. <laughs> so yeah turning to uh coal and oil the petrol car well, they call what the it, hell is petrol well just you know diesel <laughs> can you have you can diesel Ask or gasoline European, buddy. right yeah. Pet- petroleum car uh, Paris, okay. 1889. And then uh, a few years later, and it was the dishwasher in 1893. I use that every day. Yeah. Great, yeah. great inventions. Yes. Okay. So one of my favorite, just because it's it's sort of post-carbon ready. If, oh, the, if the power goes out, right? you could still use this invention, and uh-huh. that's the es- escalator. A genius. Exactly. I mean, all <laughs> the shopping malls are still available. <laughs> Yeah, well, you could you you know you just walk up it if it stops working. And I don't think the inventor of the escalator realized what an awesome role it would have in movies. What do you, you know, mean? like like you ever see Total Recall where they're chasing Arnold Schwarzenegger on the escalator and he's using all the people on it as human shields while they're shooting at him. I mean, that that scene is that Total Re- Recall or is that the one where he's um, the dad? In the mall. Well, it's probably in that, too. That's what I'm saying. Okay. That it appears over and over, yes. chases down, up escalator. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's huge for the movie Trump, industry. Uh, Trump announces his presidency. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the peak moment of the escalator. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, not every single uh, uh, invention was 
quite as awesome as the escalator. I mean, the 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 next one that I kind of took note of was the picture phone, which huh. although it, you know sort of influential, we were using all these things like FaceTime and Zoom and whatnot these days. But back then, it was like this honking thing on the desk and uh, they didn't show this but i bet you there was a ten thousand pound camera somewhere yeah. on site to another make that work. ahead of its time invention in 1964 yeah. i mean just think about how bad tvs were that right? <laughs> yeah i want to talk about the sort of the pinnacle of probably of all world fairs debuts and that is uh cherry coke well rob you should be a i mean that's from atlanta right well 1982 I mean, what genius thought of the idea to add uh, cherry or cherry <laughs> syrup to Coke. I mean, that's on the level of inventing electric light or a uh, telephone, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. Well, well it, it, it's, you go, what, about, what about 1985, buddy? I mean, we went to ball games. We were kid Yeah, yeah, up. Jumbotron, yes. 1985. And Unbelievable. Again, a huge advance in technology, <laughs> making a really big version of something we already had all over the well, place. Well, there's nothing better than going to an event <laughs> Yeah, and instead of watching it live right in front of your face, you look up at a screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to see it. Right? Yeah, yeah. When you got to watch like people kissing as they play the "Kiss Me" song or whatever, or or you got to watch those proposals of marriage that fail in front of a crowd of fifty thousand. <laughs> That's right. Well, <laughs> yay, Jumbo You know, maybe maybe we could end on on an invention that you know has yet to be proven. Okay. You know, yet to prove itself but i i still have hope and so does our, our buddy arnold schwarzenegger and that is the hydrogen car oh, i hate the hydrogen car <laughs> yeah a lot of 2001 baby well that's fascinating because i remember that was that was really pushed around uc davis around that time so soon after it was invented it was like on campus in california i was i was oh, yeah. uh, i was yeah i was a uh, visiting well you could drive your hydrogen car now yeah right? what are we up to at least 50 percent of all vehicles <laughs> on the road or something like that is, yeah. that, or is that what we're talking about yeah uh, uh, not, not maybe 50 yeah 50. five zero <laughs> yeah. total cars yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this is the case of, of diminishing returns, which we're going to get back to in a bit. But, you know, the, you're seeing that the technology goes from sort of world changing to, ah, oh, we, we tweet this, though. We dropped a cherry in the drink. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, yeah. you know, it's not just the inventions, I think, for these world fairs that, yeah. that made them so so important and relevant for a long time. You know, the, a lot of it was uh, was culturally focused as well, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, art and exposure to different, you know, peoples from different parts of the world. Before people could really travel far and wide, certainly before the internet, the advent of, you know, of, of film, this is a way for people to be exposed to completely different types of culture. You know? Sure. Yeah, so uh, I'm often described as the wet blanket guy, uh, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that to you right here because uh, you guys know about in 1939 uh, the big cultural thing at the San Francisco World's Fair uh, was Sally Rand's Nude Ranch, <laughs> where 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 customers could watch topless cowgirls ride donkeys while playing ping pong. <laughs> you just made all that up. I, no, I did not. Yes, uh, yes. So, uh, Jason, I know you want to recreate that later today on the farm, <laughs> but please refrain. I, I would be happy to look in. I'd be happy to be the first one. To, I just don't want to get on those anywhere near the glass topless. house. You know, with, <laughs> right. I, yeah, keep those away from the glass house. But yeah, right. We have a you have the you have all this European culture, and then of course the crass Americans come in with with the new donkey <laughs> ranch. ranch with the, the, the ranch. new donkey ranch. <laughs> but I, you know, thinking about this also about culture and social social issues. Uh, yeah, that was a big deal. The United Nations was a 20th century invention, right? And and before that, how would how would these countries get together and and think about trade relationships and 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 labor and other human rights issues? Well, it was at these world's fairs. So a lot of progressive social issues were actually dealt with. And so there were, there are these documents that are produced in addition to all of the technology and all the arts and commercial products uh, on display. And, and, and not only on display like temporarily, but by golly, uh, we've all been to cities probably where the, the world's fairs, the expos have obvious long-term changes. And, and probably the, the most prominent place this occurred was in Paris, which, which it had, sets the record. It's hosted the most world fairs or expos. Six. Really? Yeah, they've hosted six. 
all between the years 1855 and 1947. And these have absolutely transformed Paris. So the first metro line was put in, a bridge over the Seine, tons of monuments, right, have been put in, museums, parks, and my favorite, the Eiffel Tower. Well, so as you're <laughs> listing this off, you can see that a city can maybe become more grand, uh, Eiffel Tower, beloved, of course. But let's get real here for a second, because there's a lot of crud that gets uh, slapped around during World's Fairs, too. Uh, you guys know of some of the uh, sort of phallic other towers that... Oh, gosh, uh, yeah. I mean, the the, uh, the the Space Needle in the Seattle, I think that oh, was yeah. a 1962 yeah. World's well, Fair. Well, the, the Space Needle is actually pretty... Damn elegant com- compared to what comes after. You got the uh, Tower of the Americas in San Antonio. Never which heard of it. I don't, you know, <laughs> it's not so in my nature really to make fun of a particular place or something. But it, 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 this tower is a pretty, it's like the poor man's space Talking needle. Talking about diminishing returns, we go from the Eiffel Tower yeah. you know, yeah. to... Uh, the space needle's kind of In terms of, of pretty, phallic symbols, yeah. we're just like going downhill. Yeah, oh, yeah. so the, the, the Tower of the Americas looks like you could hit the base of it with a sledgehammer and the whole thing would fall down. <laughs> uh, and then you go from that to the Knoxville World's Fair in 1982 with the Sun Sphere, which just is a cylinder with a big disco ball on top of it. And that was oh a specialized God. fair, so it wasn't. It didn't have the status of the the Grand World Fair, but it was it, it was wait, important. Wait, that was 1982. 1982 yeah. Knoxville. So didn't disco die by 1982? <laughs> yeah, I don't. So they're, they're way behind. I don't know what they were thinking. The the Simpsons in its early uh, years actually did a total parody on. The, the Knoxville World's Fair. Basically, Bart and his buddies got uh, hold of a driver's license and they were thinking, well, we could go anywhere. Where should we go? And they got a, a travel guide that was talking about talking up the 1982 Knoxville World's Fair. And, <laughs> and they didn't realize that it was 82 or they thought it was still going on. So they drive down there. They get to that sun sphere and it's a wig shop. <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe we can play a little clip from that. We're on the home stretch. Next stop, the Knoxville World's Fair and its fabulous sun sphere. Hurry up. We've only got four days to spend at the... Uh, excuse me. Is this the World's Fair Visitor Center? Used to be. Back in 1982. (laughs) You're 14 years too late. What about the sun sphere? (laughs) You mean the wig sphere. You're welcome to go up there if you want to see 16,000 boxes of unsold wigs. I hate this place. Yeah, and then and then one of the characters ends up knocking the sun sphere down by throwing a rock at it. <laughs> well, then of course, uh, you know, the the latest one was in Korea, I think, and that that thing only looks like it's about 40 feet tall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're making we're making fun of, of some of this stuff, but the, you know the the World's Fairs, and I think you touched on this a little bit, Jason. They really were a means of promoting international trade and exchange. You know the the promulgation of of innovations. You had uh, Alexander Graham Bell going from from Philadelphia, where he just he launched the the telephone, and he t- took it to Paris a couple of years later. Yeah. You know. Um, Sort of spread it internationally. Yeah, and but there's there this there was this tension that was noted ex- very early on. The first World's Fair, even there was commentators and and some were waxing about these idealistic visions of spreading progress throughout the world and how wonderful this was to bring bring the world together, you know, with peace and commerce and and technology. And then the the next town over the paper is basically talking about how those foreigners are going to rip off our intellectual property and we're <laughs> idiots <laughs> i mean it's like identical to what happens today right yeah so. yeah yeah well uh i think you're making a little turn here jason towards some of the the downsides of a world's fair i mean the the maybe that's a pretty minor one the idea of hey you're ripping off my awesome invention but uh there's there's some other stuff that i think we got to delve into now i don't know did you guys ever read that book by uh i think it's lars erickson devil in the white oh eric lars erickson (laughs) eric larson (laughs) same (laughs) thing if you're dyslexic it works yeah yeah yeah. i didn't Um, read that no the book is called devil in the white city and it's about the uh world's fair in chicago and they built this big you know a bunch of white buildings but 
they, they don't just talk about the World's Fair because they, they talk about how this serial killer is basically stalking <laughs> the scene. So it's it's kind of a, uh, I don't know, maybe Larson had a, a good sense of some of the downsides that come with World's Fair. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's kind of hard, maybe hard to blame the World's Fair for... You know, a serial so wait, event. every World's Fair doesn't have its like res- <laughs> it's like the mascot for the Olympics, but it's the serial killer for oh, the World's Fair. The mascots for the World's Fairs are hysterical, oh, by I'm the sure way. If you want to go look at those, oh man. Yeah, well, talk talk about dark sides. Let's talk about the exploitation of people. I mean, maybe the best example of this is at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. Mm-hmm. It was the it was the centennial, the hundredth anniversary of the signing of the. Louisiana Purchase. So they called it the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. And uh, it was attended by more than 19 million people. So mm-hmm. it was one of the biggest ones I think we ever hosted in the United States. And, you know, people uh, raved about that. I think it was like a 22 story high Ferris wheel that wow. they had there. Yeah. And, you know, the public debut of the x ray machine. Huh. The ice cream cone. I bet, that, I bet that they just lined the people up to go get x-rayed, right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so you're right. just getting bombarded <laughs> by radiation. Um, but the real dark side to this thing was that they, they, in kind of the true spirit of Louisiana Purchase, you know, where we colonized the western half or two-thirds of the, of, of the United States, they brought in thousands of indigenous peoples from around the world and put them on public display at this this world's fair like it was basically like a giant human zoo and they actually got the cooperation of the the sort of the scientific community you know this is around a time where there's a lot of fucked up eugenic yeah, shit and yeah. you know scientific study we, we've talked about this phrenology and you know. stuff yeah and maybe the best sort of awful example of this is is this Cong- Congolese man that they put on display I think his name was Otabenga and they sort of presented him as this pygmy, you know, from from Africa, and and his uh, his tribe. They actually did have a tradition of sharpening their front teeth to to points, uh-huh. and so they they put him on display. And then after the World's Fair, there they sent him to a zoo, in New York, right? And he thought he was going there <laughs> to be actually be a caretaker of like this elephant that they had there. But instead, they actually put him on display, uh. you know, as as like an exhibit. At the zoo. And in fact, the New York Times heralded the exhibit with a headline, Bushman shares a cage with Bronx Park apes. Oh, that's incredible. Just horrific. Yeah, now, I, yeah. You can't, I mean, I don't know. It's just so heinous. It's like hard to even comment. And it's it's crazy that like the, I don't know what the, new, is the New York Times the paper of record or whatever, you know, the, yeah. the, the that, that, that they're. Yeah, this is great. This is fine. And, and you know, and I was talking about the sort of the dis- display of peoples, and there are other examples of World's Fairs. Yeah. It's, it's really, not just St. Louis. Yeah, just it was all really, of, all over. Really disturbing. But the other thing I think we just need to point out is you—you you talked about Jason the sort of the economic development that came. It's a little like when when cities host the Olympics now or something. Mm-hmm. Right. The exploitation of labor, bringing people in 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 often terrible working conditions. I think. There's stories about, you know, African-American um, workers in Chicago and the way that they were treated. Um, just this sort of yeah. underbelly that is not visible to, to people necessarily, but is definitely part of the picture. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. always wondered about that when you see a, a, something as big as a World's Fair or a, whatever. I've never been to one, but like a Disney World. Like, yeah. what does the, the steam tunnels underneath that place <laughs> look like? Like, how... How massive of a horrible work setting is there for them? Yeah, and that that tension was brought forth by the labor movement to try to like force rights improvements because they often had to be put together very quickly under duress and they mm-hmm. had the attention of the world. And so they often use this then as also springboards for uh, supposed improvements. But there was definitely that was that was a problem with all these. The other thing is I sort of I sort of think of these as early versions of of like these Las Vegas consumer conventions, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> like that everyone just goes nuts about and there's all these gadgets and there's write-ups, the news reports, uh covering what's that what's the giant electronic convention called i don't even know but yeah i only know the comic-con one yeah right, right. maybe maybe there's some the portion of that with the cultural but, yeah but this was this this was akin to that and and so it really then was propelling consumerism obviously so not only did you have these great inventions but you had often the the, the companies 
that were then marketing them and selling them, right? Like like uh, like Cherry Coke, for gosh sakes. <laughs> yeah. right? um, I mean, early toilets, for example, were were shown here. There was great inventions like this. <laughs> Showing so not, people the toilet. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah Don't so, sit on that. It's just well, for display. Well, the London, the London, the very first. I'm going back to these notable inventions. The very first one had the first public toilets, flush toilets. Was Public, nice, like no yeah. walls or what? <laughs> <laughs> what you didn't realize is you were actually on display yeah, when you yeah, went in yeah, there. Right. Yeah, right, right. They used a plate glass. You know? Oh, they used the uh, the 1964 picture phone to the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> Two way mirror. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about propelling you know, sort of consumerism. This is, I think, one of the the reasons we wanted to bring the first World's Fair up as this sort of watershed moment in the the history that brought us here to where we are today and. And it really is such a testament to this this sort of like almost religious devotion to to progress, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so much of the almost the propaganda of these these world's fairs and expos was really around this idea of like, look at all these inventions, the future that's yeah. going to come. And 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 I think that maybe the ultimate expression of that was was the 1939 World's Fair. In New York City, I believe, right? Yeah, it was, there was this display called Futurama. In fact, they did a Futurama 2 later. But Wow, that's um, like right on the brink of World War yes, II. Yeah, there's a lot of tension in the room. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a, the Futurama was this exhibit that was sponsored by General Motors. They hired this guy who had actually done a previous exhibit for Shell, mm. right? So hand-in-hand fossil fuel interest there. And he created this like enormous scale model city, creating a vision for for a city of the future. I think mm-hmm. city of like from 1960, which seemed far off to them then. Yeah, and it was the largest scale model ever constructed. I think huh. it might still be the largest. It included more than 500,000 buildings in this scale. You know, a million trees and 50,000 motor vehicles. Some of them were <laughs> like actually moving around, right? Yeah. And what it really represented was sort of the, the modern city, a vision of the modern city and suburbia. It was all built around a highway system and it had all these like cutting edge technologies, you know, multi lane highways. I, I bet you they didn't have nearly as many lanes as a current uh, highway know, yeah. in, say, LA sure. or Atlanta or something. But, you know, they had these semi automated vehicles, they had power plants, they had farms for artificially produced crops, they had like platforms on the roofs of buildings for flying machines. Oh, awesome. You By know, 1960, all... we were supposed to have flying cars. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> the Jetsons. You're really making me think of Walt Disney. You, either of you guys ever been to Walt Disney World? World. I've been to, uh, the been to Walling World. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You 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 showed up and couldn't get in. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. So uh, then you know, Jason, about Tomorrowland. Yeah, right? well, there's, the, there's a thing. There's a there's something like Futurama at Disneyland yeah. in, in the L.A. area. And I think the philosophy of Walt Disney was right in on this. He had this whole notion of wanting to actually build a future city that he called the Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. Huh. Which, if you take that acronym, it becomes EPCOT. And the EPCOT Center that was developed in 1982 in... Orlando was Florida was the bad Disney park uh, managers uh, realization of Walt Disney's original vision for this place. And I got to just tell you guys. So I had an aunt who lived in in that part of the world and we would go visit and Epcot was on the horizon. So my parents actually got this poster and they put it up in our house and it said something like (laughs) on October 1st, 1982, tomorrow is coming or the future is here. It was right next to your Farrah Fawcett Majors poster. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we had this Epcot poster and I think it was either the year it opened or the next year. So I was like 10 or 11. We went to Epcot Center and I had this big anticipation because the the poster was all looked like some futuristic space thing and, and uh, you're like, oh. oh it was such a letdown <laughs> when we got there i wanted to tell you specifically about this pavilion there the universe of of energy okay. and uh, so this was a a special area and a ride that was sponsored of course by exxon <laughs> Right, it, so the universe of energy was narrowed down to very specific yeah, energy yeah. types. Well, yeah. and this this thing was available from 1982 to 2004, and it wow. explored the world of energy through these big film presentations. And I remember me and my sister, uh, my parents just let us roam the park. So we went in and we got on this ride, and you're in the the dark on this slow moving bench, <laughs> essentially. 
And it just, it like takes you into a jungle, uh, a, a fake jungle, and you could see these like really crappy steam machines. They're really noisy. They're like, yeah. and then this pile of steam hits you in the face and it smells bad. <laughs> and there's dinosaurs around and they're like that really bad animatronic I mean, stuff. Is this supposed to be like a historical review? Like this is where energy... You know, Fossil fuel scheme from? Yeah, or I think they, that's basically what they were saying. Uh, the world of energy is dinosaurs. <laughs> and <laughs> it was it was really, I remember at the time, it was really boring uh, and it, just a terrible thing for an amusement park and not real informative. And the weird thing is, you know, it took them so long to replace it. And finally in 1996, it became Ellen's Energy Adventure. Which had featured Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> 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 because she's an energy expert. And Bill Nye, the okay. science guy. Okay. But then here's, here's the really crazy part, is that it closed uh, in 2017 and got replaced with Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Oh, my god! So, you, you know, you go from this world's fair. Like, so I, I don't know. I think of Epcot as almost like a permanent world's right, fair. Right, right. Yeah. You know, except commercialized maybe even more. And then... It goes from trying to explain energy, even if it's tainted by the corporate view, down to, uh, you know, a goofy Marvel movie. Well, uh, and it's actually, I mean, we lament, you know, on, on Crazy Town all the time about the lack of energy literacy. I don't know how good of a job that that was doing being, you know, sponsored uh, by Oh, that's why I'm Mobile. here now. That's <laughs> right. why I'm here. <laughs> but... But at least there's some attempt. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, now, whatever. You know, it's like Exactly. We're going to be in space. Well, yeah, you get it from those little uh, infinity stones, exactly. right? That's where the energy comes from. Exactly. Well, what, what's, you know, what the, the, the irony, of course, is that we don't have flying cars. We don't have hydrogen cars. We haven't figured out how to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. The whole infrastructure of modern society is sort of crumbling in a sense, like, the expo architecture, in a sense, of which you see in cities like um, like Knoxville or whatever, and these these theme these theme park displays that obviously um, have a have a life to them. It just kind of reminds us that at the same time that they were putting these people on display, these colonial nations were like trotting out. Yeah, here's the people I've got from Africa in my realm, and. It's ironic because we were they were sort of making fun of them. Yeah, they're 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 juxtaposing them yeah. to this new technology that right. was you know well, this grand society. Right. Well, and you you had this photo that you shared a share that had these sort of fat white guys in bowler hats and suits looking at uh, you know some some indigenous yeah. people in a yeah, in outside, a pen and outside kind of a fenced area and i mean the right. whole the whole thing is weird cuz those those guys in the bowler hats look like some kind of nut jobs as well you know like, <laughs> yeah they're sitting right. there staring at the, you know, the whole thing yeah. is just surreal well the irony of course is that you know the world's fair culture in a sense is a culture that is going to like go the way of this Epcot <laughs> display. Whereas these people who were put on display to make fun of, they had these cultures that had, had been persisting for thousands of years. Right. And in many respects, they're the ones we have to learn from now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's funny because the, the world's fairs, I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, this over time, we we eroded something that that sort of needs to stick around. But there's there's another trend that's happened over the whole course of the World's Fairs too, and that's the classic case of diminishing returns, mm -hmm. which you know any any economics student will have studied the idea of diminishing marginal returns. And it simply I, I find the simplest way to to describe it is with pizza and beer. You know, like mm -hmm. if you're hungry and you order a pizza <laughs> and you got a pitcher of beer and you pour yourself a glass, you eat that slice, you drink a beer, you're like, oh, that was really the satisfying. First, the first drink and the first slice yeah. are the best. Yeah, let me have another. And the next one's okay, but not great. By the time you get to the 27th slice, you're vomiting all over yourself. Yeah, and, I mean, that's what happened yeah. with my cocaine addiction. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the you see that in the technology even right. the simplest coolest part of a world's fair like you know you go down that list from the most amazing earth-shattering world changing. transformational yeah. inventions yeah yeah, yeah things sure. that really change and it gets just gets uh kind of dimmer and dimmer yeah as you they're go less along. impressive as you go on but there 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 seems to be this attempt right now 
to use these world's fairs and, and, and they've turned towards sustainability as a major theme. And it's, it's very ironic because it's coming from this culture that has no clue what that means. And there's actually a special kind of world fair. They're called the horticultural world fairs. And it's hmm. fascinating. I don't know exactly what the history is, but these Spart- sponsored by Archer Midlands Daniel and <laughs> right. well, uh, uh, Monsanto. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the the, the Netherlands are very much involved in these. I uh-huh. love them, um, but they they're in other places as well. So, for example, just to give you an example of what's going on. They're taking sort of these urban centers because all these world's fairs are, are about this sort of hyper modern urban culture in a yeah. way, right? But how do we make them sustainable and green? So this this is this is these are themes and mottos of some very recent events. The 2019 Horticultural Expo in Beijing, quote, live green, live better. The 2020 World Beijing. Expo. Beijing. Yeah, okay. Beijing, right. The, the, the 2020 World Expo in Dubai, quote. Oh, another green city. Yeah. Sustainability, respecting and living in balance with the world we inhabit to ensure a sustainable <laughs> future for all. So, so that one's green because they uh, imported a, a shit ton of green paint and they're just painting all the right. buildings. Right. And this year, um, in 2022, Horticultural Expo in Amsterdam, quote, growing green cities. Oh, oh, Amsterdam, the city that has adopted Kate Rayworth's donut economics, which says we need to limit the size yeah. of the economy, is, is going to grow, grow green the green city. city. Well, and, and I hate to say this to my Dutch brethren, but it's also a city that's facing being underwater. Yeah. You know, it's just <laughs> yeah, so kind of hard to grow when you're underwater. I mean, you can grow, but... I, but it's grasping at straws in a sense. It's like this idea that we can we can like shove ha- house plants into urban centers and make them sustainable. Is is it, 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 I, I'm overstating. Uh, look, the case. That, that's the negative spin. You're totally right. Look, we can shut down this podcast, and the three of us just need to hit Beijing, Dubai, and Amsterdam, and it's all solved. Hey guys, we got a five-star review with the subject line, a binge-worthy podcast, exclamation point. This one, this is exciting. Okay. So in this review, it says, the only things keeping me going these days are new episodes of Crazy Town and The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Both offer a sobering view of so our future. <laughs> well, yeah, but that means you feel sorry for yourself, too, because you're, you're putting out this content. Both offer a sobering view of our future if we don't collectively get our act together and some good old-fashioned entertainment. Excellent. Oh, that's nice. That is nice. That and, I, and I appreciate people who can stare into the darkness with us, but still do something about it. Uh, yeah, laugh uh, maniacally, right? <laughs> and, and how did this person know what outfits we wear? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for leaving us reviews, and I would encourage all our listeners, if you have a chance, a few moments, please go out and do that. It helps others find the podcast. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. Yeah, so if we're thinking about doing the opposite, I, I what about doing a World's Fair? Mm-hmm. Make make a lot of fanfare okay. about this. Different kind of World's Fair, the opposite yeah. World's Fair. So let's do like the low-tech World's Fair. Or appropriate okay. tech. Yeah, yeah so let, we'll, we'll hire Krista Decker, for those who don't know him. Chris Chris has this amazing website, Low Tech Magazine. Yeah, um, fascinating stuff. Which is, yeah, totally incredible. And maybe we'll pair Chris with um, with some, you know, in, indigenous peoples, let's say from the Amazon, or Perfect. maybe from around the world. Sure. And they could organize a World's Fair yeah. that was basically about promoting appropriate, responsible, truly sustainable, truly just. Can, can, I, bring, can I bring an invention? Would that sure. be all right? I, yeah. I got an idea for a reusable cup. Uh, it's your hands. You just <laughs> cup them together and you can scoop up all the water you want. It's, it's not good for coffee, okay? Or, or other yeah, you might beverages. burn yourself with that. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, okay, that, that's a mighty fine idea. But if you if you really think of the opposite of the World's Fair... 
let's just go down to the local scale, right? Mm-hmm. Like the block party. I love block parties. Is mm-hmm. really the opposite. Um, you start thinking about investments that build your local economy, places where you can generate ideas, and then you can come up with innovations that actually improve the health of your community. Mm-hmm. And to me, this is really all about instead of relying on gadgets and technology and and uh, sort of the individual hero inventor or the materialist way of surviving. It's about relying on your neighbors instead of the technology. And we'd probably be remiss if we didn't drop a reference here to David Fleming and the work mm-hmm. he did on... Uh, he's got that book that Sean Chamberlain has Surviving worked on the with future, him. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh, it talks about carnival and the role of yeah. it in a sustainable society. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, look, partying's great, but it just doesn't have to be at the worldwide scale. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and that reminds me when you're talking about sort of neighborliness and the importance of that and how people get by. It reminds me of a recent article you actually forwarded to me from The New Yorker that was looking at Wendell Berry and and, and his wife, Tanya, and their life. And those are the he's a famous agrarian writer, philosopher. Yeah. um, Poet, novelist. Yeah. yeah, And and I know that I've met him once. You've interacted with a number of times and quite fun to be around. Oh, Um, unbelievably (laughs) funny wise. He's this weird kind of person who uh, not only writes incredibly beautifully, but also speaks incredibly beautifully. Yeah. And and Tanya, his, his wife, is funnier than he is, too. They're such an amazing couple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And his daughter as well, who yeah. runs the Berry Center. So so anyway, I, I, I found it fascinating because they, they talk about how he moves to this place, that can, you know, this Kentucky, <laughs> this, this rural community and runs a farm and how important relying on your neighbors was for getting things done. But at the end, also, there's a tool. So we talked about, you know, the the, the technology we are going to need to rely on. And it's this tool that is a mall. And basically, a mall is like a like a giant like hammer that you're gonna, you're gonna drive stakes into the ground with, let's say, and about how this where this mall comes from. And here's this, here's this quote when he's describing to the author of the New Yorker article this mall and why it's important. What was the mall made out of? It's made out of a tree, but think about a, a, a smallish tree where you dig up around the root ball hmm. and then you hone it down into a device where the root ball is the hitting side. That's, that's you, you, uh-huh. you, you hammer things with the root ball. So this is completely different from, say, a mall you would get at a Home Depot, which right. is a, a wooden handle with a big metal head just uh, jammed onto the top of it. Exactly. And and what's neat about the root ball is that because it's all these all these uh, roots are going different directions, there's no seams that it splits on. You can hit it from any direction, and mm. there's no easy way for a, uh, uh, the thing to split open. So it's like bulletproof, in a sense, <laughs> or, or mall-proof. So wait, mall. So like, if you hit that mall with another mall, yes. it won't break. That's right. <laughs> you're, you're talking about like the Mall of America, that kind of mall. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. kind of mall. Okay. Right. Wow, well, we're yeah. getting confused here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's just call it a big hammer. <laughs> yes, nature's hammer. But I think I yeah, let's end on this quote because I think this sort of sums up a lot of what we're what we're getting at here. Wendell Berry writes: "There is a kind of genius in that mall that belongs to a placed people to make of what is at hand a fine." durable tool at the cost of only skill and work. We want to give a special thanks to Ilana Zuber, our star researcher of the watershed moments through history. Without her work, there's no way we could have covered such sweeping topics this season. Yeah, and we also want to thank our other outstanding volunteers. Anya Steyer provides original artwork for us, and Taylor Antal prepares the transcripts for each episode. And a big, big thank you to our producer, Melanie Travers, who helps us Bozo stay professional. And finally, thanks to you, our listeners. If you want to help others find their way to Crazy Town, please drop us a five-star rating and hit that share button when you hear an episode you like. Well, folks, a World's Fair episode demands that we get a sponsor that rises to the occasion. And sure enough, we have. The North Korean Expo 2027 contacted us, and I'm very proud of the Nampo City Development Bureau 
and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea Tourism Board, uh, because they basically really want to promote that uh, Nampo, North Korea, is going to have the World Expo in 2027 with a theme that I think uh, Crazy Town listeners are going to appreciate of sustainable autocracy. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, this is going to be one of those fairs that that remakes the city of Nampo. Uh, One of the key attractions in the works, for example, is a tower in the style of the dear leader's hairdo. (laughs) This is beautiful. It's going to be, it's going to be beautiful. Um, yeah, on the observation deck, looking at the marching bands and... Uh, Just standing on the flat top of his head. Uh, I, I'm i looking forward to this. I'm hoping that we can fly to North Korea and that we have passports that work and visas. And uh, I don't know. Sustainable autopsy. Thousands of people may show up. Crazy town. Da, 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 da. Crazy town.